Farm Progress Broadcast presents This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry. Brought to you by Case IH, solutions for every challenge, equipment for every farm. Case IH, built by farmers. Welcome to This Week in Agribusiness, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mike Pearson, joined this week by Max Armstrong, and we are, as you've noticed, not in the studio, on the trade show floor for the National Farm Machinery Show in Louisville, Kentucky this week. And Max, it's so great to get down here and have the chance to connect with friends we see once a year in Louisville. Yeah, it's kind of an old home week for many of us, and it's great to see people like Marshall Coyle from the uh, Owingsville, Owingsville, Kentucky. Kentucky. Are, am I right? You're exactly right, and it's so good to have you and Mike here. We appreciate uh, you being it's here. It's a privilege to be alongside uh, you. You're on the board, helping yes, administer sir. what goes on here. There's a lot of effort that goes into it. Well, there's a lot of effort goes into this. This is the 58th Farm Machinery Show. Um, we're sold out. We have 1.2 million square feet of climate control space and all of it is, is in use this week. We're just tickled to death with what we have and how it's grown. Like the first one I came to was 1968 and it's amazing how the changes and how much it's grown since 1968. Marshall, I've got a question. You've been working since 1968. We've seen the machinery change a lot. What about the crowds and the attendees? Do you see different folks coming year in and year out to try new things? Well, a lot of us guys that were here first might not still be around much, but but no, that's the one main thing about the National Farm Machine we've shown the tractor pull. We've got a lot of farmers, and a lot of folks that come to this show that before they leave here, they'll book next year's hotel rooms mm -hmm and gets ready to come back and visit with us again next year. So we have a lot of repeat customers. I just visited one one from Illinois though, but this is his first time to be here. Mm -hmm. And he was just having a big time in looking at all the equipment and going through and seeing the people. Marshall, what's your favorite thing to do when you're on the grounds for the show? You've been involved so many years, you've got to have a couple of favorites. Well, I actually probably, I, I love looking at the new equipment. You know, we do have a lot of short line manufacturers that come here that you might not find in other places. And then one of my favorite things is the tractor pull. Yeah. So You're not alone in that for sure. Some improvements coming here in the future? Is there something that we can look forward to in terms Absolutely. of? Absolutely. Uh, we have upgrades. $180 million that the General Assembly has approved for expansion and improvements and upgrades to these facilities. That shall be underway very shortly. Uh, in the, that, that's already approved in the proposed budget. For this time, for the next two years, there's another 200 million that at this point in the house budget that we hope will stay and be able to continue. We're going to have, do a lot of improvements to Freedom Hall. We'll be adding another wing to this facility. And if you, those that come often know when we have a big crowd like this, hotel rooms can be a little scarce in Louisville and our plans are to put a hotel on these buildings. Oh my, bigger and better. Marshall, thank you for sharing with us those plans. We appreciate it. Good to see you. Good to see you and great to have you guys here. Thank you. Us. Marshall Coyle from Owingsville, Kentucky. Well, some folks are thinking about how to upgrade their farmsteads with buildings. And I know Mr. Mike Pearson had a recent visit about that. The start of the new year is a good time to assess your farm building needs. Joining us now is Dennis Lee, the farm product line manager with Morton Building to share some planning tips. Dennis, what do we need to be considering while we're thinking about our farm building needs? So, you know, the, the first thing we encourage producers to do is to, to evaluate your operation and evaluate the current buildings that you're using. Uh, you know, farm machinery uh, implements are getting larger and more sophisticated every day. So we want to make sure that we have a facility that can accommodate that equipment. As you're thinking through how these pieces of equipment are changing, there's so many other things being, uh, being adjusted on the farm right now. Dennis, what all should we be considering in uh, thinking of a building upgrade? Yeah, so, you know, one thing that we want to look at first is height. You know, equipment is getting much taller and much larger and height is something that just cannot be added to a building so you need to evaluate the building you have now you know is it tall enough to get equipment in we can we can often add length to a building but you just can't add height or width so you know, make that evaluation uh, we can expand uh, building doors in you know, depending on the location uh, but you're going to want to evaluate that from a structural standpoint also um, and then there's a the depreciation factor. So a lot of buildings now have lived their, uh, you know, their depreciation life. And, uh, you know, we all know nothing is getting less expensive as time goes on. So there really is no better time than now to, to make an investment in a building that suits your needs better. 
Absolutely, Dennis. And a lot of times when we think farm buildings, we think storage, but so many times these buildings are crucial for successful operation on the farm. Can you talk about how, how some producers are, are viewing this with regard to expanding the operation? Yeah, you know, uh, we, we see a lot of uh, farms where family members are coming back to the operation. Uh, you know, you must grow to succeed in today's market. So having a plan for growth and expansion is very important. Uh, we're also seeing a considerable amount of direct to consumer sales uh, from the farm. So you have to evaluate that operation and, you know, is it is it safe? Is it suitable, uh, you know, for having uh, for having the general public on there if that's going to be part of your operational plan? That makes sense, Dennis. And for growers who are going through this evaluation process right now, Morton Building is running the Building Value Days. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So now through February, we're holding our annual Building Value Days. You know, this is a, a, a great event, an annual event for us. Uh, producers can save on new buildings uh, during this time of year. Uh, you know, there are some certain restrictions that apply, but it will be, you know, the best discount that we offer throughout the entire year. So I uh, encourage everybody to visit our website, uh, mortonbuildings.com, and there's plenty of information there. Today's larger, heavier equipment can lead to more soil compaction issues. Firestone Ag IFVF tires with 82 technology maximize load capacity while minimizing soil compaction. Visit firestoneag.com to learn more. Now it's time for our market conversation down here from the National Farm Machinery Show. We've got the chance to talk lending. Matt Oberly serves as the Vice President for Ag Lending with Farm Credit Mid-America. Matt, thanks for talking with us today. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Farm Credit Mid-America, what territory do you guys cover? Oh, we currently now cover six states, uh, Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio, Tennessee, Arkansas, and a portion of Missouri. All right, so that eastern Corn Belt really is your, is your sweet spot. Matt, how were yields last year across your territory? Uh, very much uh, a surprise with the weather we had uh, from, I can say, near 100% of the customers that I work directly with, it was yields above expectation, and for many, it was their uh, highest yields ever. Wow, record year for growers in your region. Yes, sir. How has that changed their planning for this upcoming year? Have they, were they able to get decently marketed during the prices last year? Well, there was a mix of that. There's uh, certainly opportunities. Uh, some guys were not as heavily priced or operations as what they might historically have been because the unknown of the crop we were going to produce. So with additional bushels outside of budgets that they were anticipating, uh, we're currently seeing quite a, a large amount of unpriced bushels on the balance sheet. Uh, and that has had an impact on financials. However, we came out of three of the most profitable years looking back since the 1940s. So farmers' balance sheets and financial statements are well positioned for this position that we're in right now. That's good to hear. You're still seeing strong working capital numbers. You're still seeing some, some balance sheet health across the sector. Absolutely, absolutely. We've had a, uh, a lot of working capital build up until this 24 season. Uh, with the decreased prices, we're seeing the pullback of that a little bit currently, but all in all, very well positioned to go into what we believe will be a, or a, a time frame of decreased margins with the lower crop prices. And, and those margins are shrinking, as you mentioned. Yes, lower sir. crop prices have come down. We're also seeing a rise in interest rates. Is that something that growers are confronting as they get in for renewal season this year? Absolutely. We currently have those conversations. Uh, quite often about, uh, you know, we're consistently talking with the customers about the health of their balance sheets, how do they position for their operation for the future, for growth, uh, what needs they have in their operation, and rates are a big piece of that conversation. Do you have an expectation of rates coming down, going up as we get through this year, or do you just have to be ready for either? I think we are, uh, I say we as a whole, are planning to, we know what we have currently. You know, the Fed has stated that they anticipate some cuts coming up here, but uh, the most prudent that we can do is to plan for what we know. And then if there are rates, that's gonna create opportunities for either to convert rates down, you take advantage of those short-term rates that are already adjustable, and that's gonna have a significant impact on financial, or you know, on your cash flows, if we can get those operating rates down. And absolutely, absolutely. Matt Oberlies, thank you so much for filling us in this week here at the National Farm machinery show in Louisville. We appreciate the opportunity for the conversation. Thank you. And folks, we'll be back with more from the Louisville Farm Show after this. As we came into the booth here where all the red equipment of Case IH was on display, Kurt Coffey was one of the first guys we saw. Vice President of North America for Case IH, good to see you once more. Good to see you again. 
I'm uh, always happy to see you, Max. I'm happy when you send me selfies of pictures with <laughs> you and my dad at other shows too. So it's always it's always nice to see it my friend fun Max. To, fun to run into that guy <laughs> yeah. just a few weeks ago. I, yeah, I Gordy could, Bill, right? I could see that the apple didn't fall far no. from the tree here. We're pretty energetic. You enjoyed in the past few days, I know, being with dealers, Case IH dealers, and they got to see this big AF11 combine. Yeah, we had our all dealer meeting last week in Florida, um, down in sunny Orlando. It was a treat. Almost all of our dealers came down and we had a sneak peek unveiling of this. I call it the Apex Predator. It's at the top and we're pretty proud of it. Being able to sit with our engineering team and a customer who we had on site last week at the meeting, um, we were running about seven, 7,500 bushel an hour continuously and the engineer and the farmer said, well, watch this. And we went up over eight. And so we were running about eight mile an hour, 16 row corn head, 260 bushel corn, it kind of blew my mind. We run a 9250. We take it easy because we can't keep up with semis. Right, right. But truly mind blowing. And we talk capacity and capability. And I know you're going to spend some time with Leo on technical details, but the purpose of the design around grain quality, which is our heritage, the simplicity of the design, the purpose of that design, that's actually more exciting to me probably than capacity. Capacity and efficiency is important. But staying true to our roots on simplicity and design and grain quality is, it's Case IH. Sitting where we're sitting, under this spout, I'm reminded again of the ability to operate efficiently in the field, to operate quickly at a time when the producer really needs to be able to move. I mean, a top purchase driver across all customers is technology. Yeah. Um, it could be the automation features in this machine. We call it AFS Harvest Command. Putting a relatively unskilled operator in the machine, they pick their crop and they go. I've had many customers come and say, that's why we buy. But other automation features along the way, grain cart automation to help with safety or skill, gaps in skill. Sure. Um, each of those little building blocks along the way, we have to automate this, we automate that. We're on our way towards full autonomy, but each little bite along the way is a technology advancement. And we feel like we're at the tip of the spear at Case IH. So you mean it when you say purposeful, purposeful technology, uh, that's what you're talking about. It's, it's with an aim in mind. Yeah. You asked about the dealer meeting last week. I'm pretty charismatic. I stood on stage and showed a picture of me as a little guy with an old 9170, and I talked about purposeful innovations. And I told the dealers, I said, look, this is amazing, but this isn't a beauty pageant. There's purpose in everything that we're doing. It's capacity, it's quality, it's solving real world issues. The number one issue our customers are saying they have an issue with is labor. Labor, absolutely. So automation and these, these things are, are it's the purpose, it's the why. Why are we doing it? Solve problems. Your enthusiasm is contagious. You and your colleagues here on the lot, good to see you once more. <laughs> we love more. what we do, thank you, Max. Kurt Coffey, Vice President, Case IH North America, joining us here at the National Farm Machinery Show. Greg Solier now brings us his farm weather forecast for the week ahead. Well, it's been temperate. That's one thing many of the growers talked with us about here at the National Farm Machinery Show. Is that to continue? Let's ask our man who knows. Well, hope one and all are enjoying themselves down there at Louisville. Uh, weather is certainly of an easy to take nature. Certainly not quite the spring feel that we had here last week, but still decent enough. Meanwhile, changes are ahead and getting underway once again to the Pacific Northwest after a bit of a respite last week. It's the atmospheric river, the Pineapple Express, and it's a high overdrive of this still moderate to strong El Nino weather pattern. So the moisture machine is back into play as the week wears on Northern California up across the Cascades and on this particular particular go around instead of having significant downslope winds and milder Pacific air. We've got some loosening of the Arctic air and it's on the move. Much colder conditions and a change from rain to snow dependent on elevation. In any event, a sloppy go of it with lambing and calving operations getting underway. Heads up on the cold and significant moisture, not only in the early to middle parts of the week, but later in the week as well with this very cold, probably near zero type air expected up near the Canadian border. More organized snow shifting east and south of the Black Hills. Snow across the Intermountain West into the Cascades, Northern Sierra as well. So a significant moisture maker, not only into the Pacific Northwest, but into the early to middle parts of the week. Here we go again after a bit of a respite. A dynamic storm just offshore of California expected to slowly work inland. So a valley rain, some thunderstorms, downpours, and probably flooding potential. Snow on the highest peak because of the Sierra. And again, uh, over areas of the Central and Southern Plains, some sense of warmth here and a scattering of showers and thunderstorms, except for the Nebraska Panhandle on northward. 
That's the southern extent of some of this much colder air slowly settling southward here. Heads up livestock operations, but there'll be wind and warmth in a collision zone over West Texas cotton. How about that snow last weekend through New Mexico and West Texas? That was significant moisture upwards of a half a foot in some locales as the shower activity winds down across sections of California. So it will be active and moisture laden across the western states. The compliments of El Nino here for this week. Note the colder air up towards the air ahead of Minnesota down to the Black Hills and a series of disturbances, almost clipper type features expected to continue to make their way on through uh, seasonal temperatures across the Ohio, a little rain, snow mix, light stuff across the Corn Belt locales and will begin to add to the snow cover again over parts of the western and northwestern Corn Belt locales. Much colder air across the upper Midwest, the Dakotas. Next little clipper system bringing a mixture of rain and snow, light stuff, uh, but some sloppy fields expected in feedlots across the eastern Corn Belt locales. So it is a change, a little more realistic feel uh, for mid to late February. And you thought springtime was here, didn't you? Well, still some lingering effects of springtime across uh, Texas, down through Bayou Country, the Delta coming off last week's rain. There's more rain in the forecast and more to come here in the weeks to come with El Nino still going in high overdrive mode. Showers, a couple of thunderstorms in through Texas, that system off to the east, more downpours and watch the flooding potential won't take much again into lower Mississippi Delta. A couple of snowflakes in through Ban uh, Branson, Missouri area and the Ozarks had snow there last week. Cooler, drier air moving into areas of West Texas cotton in the central and southern high plains areas. Here's the last of the mild air over the northeast to New England. This frontal boundary drapes some more seasonal air up towards the Sioux and a disturbance coming out of the western Corn Belt locales and we'll bring a little rain snow mix into the central and southern Corn Belt as the week wears on. Much colder, bitter cold air up across parts of Wisconsin points on westward. That cold air lays on out. Disturbances will continue to track along it. That's the story in the coming weeks across sections of the Corn Belt. Meanwhile, mild, dry, high pressure over the southeastern states. A couple of showers down from Orlando on southward. Here is the next weather system making its way across the south end of winter wheat belt and with colder air to the north, warm down south. Showers and thunderstorms could be heavy and severe with more downpours in the southeast as the week wears on. Closed captioning for this week in agribusiness is brought to you by Pentair Hypro, a global leader in innovative spray technology for farmers for over 75 years. Well, it's not all iron that you see at the National Farm Machinery Show. We have the opportunity to visit with folks who provide services to farmers in other ways, too. And one of those is Phil Creek, Technical Service Representative with Syngenta. Phil, you have something new to talk about here, a new corn herbicide, I understand. That's exactly right. Uh, we are launching Storm Corn Herbicide this year. Uh, it's going to be a step change uh, that's going to help us to fight the uh, weed resistance of Palmer amaranth and, and pigweed to current products that are out there. That resistance problem has just grown and become tougher, and farmers have been searching for answers. You're stepping up with Storen, S-T-O-R-E-N. That's correct. Storen will bring four active ingredients, dual, pyroxysulfone, bicyclopyrone, and callisto all along with a good, strong safener. It's going to be safe to your crop, and it's going to be an incredibly useful tool in fighting water hemp and Palmer amaranth. Farmers will use it pre and post, is that right? We can go pre, we can go post, we can go early pre-plant. A lot of flexibility in this product, excellent crop safety, and uh, we're going to uh, be able to control up to 74 different weeds in, uh, in cornfields. Sometimes the tail end of the season becomes a bit of a struggle. I've known uh, corn herbicides to uh, give out, uh, give away, not really be there yet protecting the crop for the, the tail end. Uh, Storin will help with that? That is correct. What we've done is we have come combined four active ingredients with four complementary uh, phys sets of physical properties. And it's those physical properties that really regulate how long that herbicide lasts, how it binds in the soil, and what really works together to give you good weed control. And that's what we've done here is we've brought uh, four great chemistries together and uh, I think it's gonna be a game changer. Well, the company has to be in the uh, game for a long haul uh, to be able to bring a product like this forward. Syngenta certainly has the resources, the scientists, uh, the folks in the field to make it happen. Exactly, we have a great group of uh, crop protection field scientists a great group in Greensboro that uh, are working for us every day 
and uh, the products that they hand off are proven and effective and uh, we're going to really see a step change here in, in corn weed control. When will it be available? So. It's available this spring. It, uh, we are registered in, I think, the major corn growing states. Check your local state for registration. But uh, we've already got it in the country. It's ready to go. What a treat to visit with you. Thanks for sharing the store and story with us. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Bill Krieg with Syngenta. He's based in Southern Illinois. Joining us here at the National Farm Machinery Show. Well, thank you, Max. And of course, as you well know, the National Farm Machinery Show isn't just an opportunity to look at equipment. It's also an opportunity to learn from the experts. There was a dryer tech panel that took place on Thursday at the National Farm Machinery Show. Jeff Cruzen was one of the experts who spoke on it. And Jeff, what were the topics under discussion for that technology panel? Well, again, it was all about technology. It was all about talking about the mixed flow concept that is now driving a lot of interest from the customer out there of, of where they need to head for the future for the next dryer um, and, and really what is driving that well there's a couple things that are driving efficiency is coming into place better quality grain and they have less cleaning that they have to do on the dryer itself so mix flows are not a new concept but they're gaining a lot of popularity and momentum in the industry right now they are indeed and i was impressed by the discussion that really reflected that at the panel talk now jeff as folks think about mixed flow dryers there are some advantages but of course there are some differences uh, from going to the screen style what are some of the the other considerations farmers need to make? Well, one of the considerations is going to be the emissions because it is a pretty much a blanket statement for all the mixed load dryers out there. They emit particulate out of the ductwork that's along the side of the dryer. So one of the things that we have done is try to reduce that because emission standards are going to be a huge problem coming down the pike. And it's not only in the U.S. but around the world, so we have to address it. But that's one of the negatives with a mixed flow dryer is the fact that they are quote unquote known as the dirty dryer. Bees wings are there or the chaff, particulate, um, but even on the screen dryers, they're stuck there, but they're more prevalent to be uh, visually seen with a mix flow floating around the area. So now I understand AGI is aware of that. You guys have developed some new technology, the pre-cleaner. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've got cooking there? Yes, yeah, so come January this year in 2024, we introduced our new pre-cleaner that is actually built into the dryer at the receiving top or the receiving side of the dryer at the top of the dryer. What it's going to do is as the grain falls into the gravity fill, the grain is going to rainfall or go through a baffle and go back and forth so that airflow can go across and it removes the smaller lighter material and removes it from the grain. So we don't have to worry about that being in the grain. We don't have to worry about it getting to the grain bin unless you as a customer want to put it back. Jeff, thinking about what customers should think about before they look at a new dryer, what's the checklist or the, the top priorities, you think? Well, for me, and I'm going to say the competitors that were on the panel as well, it's going to be your dealer. You have to have service and support. If you don't have that, it doesn't make any difference what dryer you buy. It doesn't make a difference because that support matters all it the time. Does. At the end of the day, you've got to have support. We all have great products, but you still have to have that support. Jeff, if we've got an audience right now who's curious about learning more about AGI and the products you're bringing to the table, where should they go to get that? They could visit our website at www.aggrowth.com and look us up. We're here to help. They're here to help. Jeff Cruzen, Dryer Business Development Leader with AGI. Thank you so much for filling us in this week. All right. Thank you. Have a great day. And folks, stick around. We've got a lot more coming from the National Farm Machinery Show in Louisville. We're going to be talking with our good friends at Case IH again, so don't go away. We'll be back with more when This Week in Agribusiness returns. Farm Progress Broadcast presents This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry. Brought to you by Case IH. Solutions for every challenge. Equipment for every farm. Case IH. Built by farmers. Welcome back to this weekend's This Week in Agribusiness from the National Farm Machinery Show. Mr. Mike Pearson wasn't only here in recent days, he's been traveling. And the subject of clean fuels and the opportunity that they afford agriculture was on the agenda recently. Mike comes in to share that visit with us now. 
Low carbon fuel standards like the one found in California are driving demand for clean fuel. In fact, 60% of all diesel fuel sold in California now is biodiesel and renewable diesel using 200 million gallons of soybean oil. Those are just a few of the topics under discussion at the Clean Fuels Alliance Conference in Fort Worth, Texas last week. Joining us now is Heather Buchter. She serves as their Director of Communications. And Heather, what were some of the key takeaways from the event? Well, the annual Clean Fuels Conference really kicks off the year by bringing together decision makers from across the value chain just to make connections and build the industry. And I got to tell you, we are on the upward trajectory right now. You know, new EPA data shows that the clean fuels industry hit record growth in 2023, 4.6 billion gallons consumed. Absolutely, Heather, there is a lot of enthusiasm right now around clean fuels, and I understand you're going to help spur that enthusiasm on at Commodity Classic with a focus on the feedstuffs. Could you go into some more detail? Yeah, we have a great team heading to Houston for Commodity Classic. Our session is coordinating demand for new fuels and opportunities for new crops. So clean fuels and member companies will be discussing growing demand for biodiesel, renewable diesel, and sustainable aviation fuel and strategies to meet the industry's feedstocks needs. Absolutely. It's great to get that message out. And getting that message out, there's going to be a new face for Clean Fuels Alliance America coming up here soon. Can you tell us about the partnership with Donnie Wahlberg? Yeah, we really hit the jackpot with Donnie. So he's the star of the show Blue Bloods, a member of the band, the new kids on the block. And he's also a Boston native, which is one of the reasons um, that we thought he would be a great partner for us. And um, that's a target area for this campaign. So uh, Donnie Wahlberg is helping us engage with homeowners in the Northeast who use home heating oil. Bioheat fuel is made from biodiesel. And really switching to a low carbon fuel for the home heating sector is so simple. You just have to ask. That's what it's all about, driving that demand. Heather, of course, Clean Fuels Alliance America has a strong presence on the Internet. You've got a podcast on the site. Can you tell our audience where they can go to learn more about what you're, the work you're doing? Yeah, that's right. So we just launched the Better Cleaner Now podcast. It's available wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, we release new episodes every Wednesday morning. And this is really just a project that I've been passionate about because it gives our staff at Clean Fuels, who are experts in their field, the opportunity to have just an authentic conversation with different people and different guests with all aspects of the industry as well. So we want listeners to feel like they're eavesdropping on a really good conversation and learn a, two, a thing or two in the process as well. So we're going to take you under the hood of the car and um, really dive down deep into topics. But also if you're a newcomer and not really sure about clean fuels, then we'll have information for you there too. So the Better Cleaner Now podcast, it's available to listen to now. Greg Sode is back now with his extended farm weather forecast for the nation. Yes, indeed. Greg Solier is back in the studio, keeping an eye on those maps and charts. Greg, tell us what's the week ahead look like from a weather perspective? Well, it's more of the same, more to come. The haves and have nots, it continues on this week uh, after some respite and an easing of this very stormy weather pattern over the southern third of the country. It is back and going at it as the week wears on. A couple of rounds of moisture here over the southeastern states, but we'll start across the west and southwest. Look at the moisture plume again, up to three plus inches. Parts of the central and southern valleys of uh, California, big snows in the mountains. We may see a repeat of what we saw uh, into California here or probably a couple of weeks ago. And this may be a scenario that plays out over the next 10 days to two weeks over this particular part of the country. More good coverage moisture into the Pacific Northwest. Uh, most of the organized snowfall, eh, maybe a couple of inches expected in this particular corridor into the Corn Belt, back into the Central Plains. And that's another go of it with downpour producing showers and thunderstorms and severe. A couple of weather systems over the deep south and southeastern parts of the country from this vantage point don't foresee any early season access to field work. Not here, of course, way too early, but across the southern states and in three areas of the Carolinas will certainly keep you posted. Well, out of the uh, longer range outlook here, the four week forecast and as we wind our way into the beginning part of meteorological springtime that starts March 1st, uh, again, not the way the whole spring goes, but we do have a pretty good prod of some cooler to colder air still laying out from the northern plains out of the northeast of New England. This is midwinter type cold. It's been few and far between, but it's there. Nonetheless, southern Canadian prairie, some warmth over the southwestern reaches of the country and an active weather pattern continues on originating across California, northern and central areas, Pacific Northwest. What's left of the drought? We should be able to eradicate it. Amazing that we put uh, together some significant drought improvement over the heartland during the month of January, but here we go. 
slow into early February, an active weather pattern over the Plain States into the Ohio Valley. You know this time of the year sometimes could generate severe weather with more downpours of rain and severe weather over Texas and the southeastern portions of the country. Getting deeper into the month of March, it's a fast and we do mean fast west to east uh, jet stream flow here. It typically strengthens up on the springtime season. The Arctic air is here. More winter type feel across the northern uh, half of the country. Uh, areas from the southwest into Texas and the southeastern sections of the country above average and you know that is a ripe setup for severe weather. Probably you'll see it and get it going over the southern plains, western sections of the Tennessee Valley. A little drying trend over the southeastern part of the country. Maybe some opportunity for here. Uh, this particular area to here get into some maybe field work operations, uh, but an active weather pattern in late season storms for sections of the upper Midwest back across the Plain States areas too. So we'll add to some late season snowfall across sections of the country. Heading through the mid stretch of March, note the trough over the middle part of the country warmth here in the Pacific Northwest and we'll see a winding down and easing this active weather pattern from Texas into the Ohio Valley into the northeast of New England below average moisture for the northern plains on westward. Our Farm Progress Roundup is sponsored by Brandt Industries. Lead the field with Brandt's lineup of high quality, high capacity field grain belts and augers. Visit Brandt.ca for more. Well, we've got farm shows on our mind down here at the National Farm Machinery Show in Louisville, but some of the Farm Progress team are looking ahead to other farm shows. National Events Director Matt Youngman joins me now. And Matt, you're already looking to that next show. Where are you headed? Next show we're headed to next week is in Syracuse, New York, headed to the, the New York Farm Show. Uh, great show for the Northeast, forestry and dairy primarily, but really excited. Uh, this is the it's farm show season here. It is indeed. Wintertime, of course, is farm show season. But then, Matt, you're also looking ahead to next summer. Having a lot of good conversations here and at farm shows throughout the winter in planning for Farm Progress Show and Husker Harvest Days. Farm Progress Show coming up August 27th, 28th, and 29th. And, you know, you have big new things like this that, that are going to run in the field and really looking forward to that. Matt, we've got bigger equipment coming, it seems, every year in agriculture. We've also got more autonomy coming in agriculture. Is that a trend that will be on display? It is. We have companies coming out of the woodwork wanting to demonstrate their take on autonomy. And it's, it's cool to see all this technology evolving and all these new companies kind of coming from everywhere and, and wanting to put on a show in front of the crowd. Is it changing the way things flow at the Farm Progress Show in Boone? It is. You know, you need a lot of one-on-one -on -one time to explain this technology. So it's a lot of getting farmers in the cab and showing them. And, and it, it's a lot of show and tell with this technology versus being able to just stand and look at it next to it. That's true. So dates are 27th, 28th, and 29th for the Farm Progress Show. Yep. Then you go over to Grand Island, Nebraska, Husker Harvest Days again this year. Matt, there's been an ongoing change of focus or a, an addition of focus for the Husker Harvest Days. Fill us in. It's always been a great irrigation show. It's, it's a global irrigation show, but uh, Nebraska is the number one beef state. So we're putting a lot of emphasis into the beef programming, additional seminars, additional speakers, those great cattle handling demonstrations, the breeds, the stock dogs. There's just everything for the livestock producer there at Husker Harvest Days, September 10th, 11th, and 12th. 10th, 11th, and 12th in Grand Island. Are you hearing more from attendees? They'd like to see more of a livestock focus. Well, if you look at the profile of the growers there in the Western Corn Belt, they are irrigated row crop farmers and they've got beef, whether it's a feedlot or cow-calf operation. And so, you know, we want to make sure that the show serves them well and it, it is it is their show. And, and so really excited for the kind of the cool new things we're going to bolt onto that show this year. It is. New things are always coming out, Matt. And of course, where can people go to keep track with the latest and greatest coming from either Farm Progress Show or Husker Harvest Days? Well, you know, you guys here on, on TV every weekend and then farmprogressshow.com, huskerharvestdays.com and if you know if, if you think if you're thinking about going to Syracuse next week, uh, newyorkfarmshow.com. Still time to get involved. Absolutely. Matt Youngman, thanks so much for joining us for the update. You bet. Good to be with you, Mike. And folks, we'll be back with more after this. Next on This Week in Agribusiness, it's Max's Tractor Shed, where we spotlight another great American farm tractor. Well, at the National Farm Machinery Show, we ask the question many times of our friends, what do you have in the shop? What are you working on back home? In one case in Ohio, the gentleman felt a sense of urgency to get a tractor ready. We'll share that story in Max's Tractor Shed. Brought to you by the folks at Mystic Lubricants. Mystic Lubricants producers are made to make it last. Well, Greg Gruby in Ohio seems to always have something going on in terms of a tractor restoration. Actually, a few years ago, he found in Facebook Marketplace an old family tractor, was able to get it back and to get it restored. What I saw most recently, though, was a Case D model, a J.I. Case D, 
made in 1949. And he was working on that to get it ready for a show. The Fairfield County Tractor Show coming up there in Ohio. Greg has restored many of them through the years, and this D is just the latest. I think the Model D was made for a period of about 15 years. Not quite, but almost 15 years, starting in 1939. You might guess by looking at that finish that this isn't Greg's first restoration rodeo, to be sure. He does a great job in bringing those old machines back to life, and it just so happens that the J.I. Case colors are his favorite. We certainly appreciate that. Mark Stock is selling them all, regardless of color. Let's get the Big Iron Report now from Mark. Well, hello, Max. We saw a lot of people this week at the National Farm Machinery Show in Louisville, Kentucky. Lots of questions about the value of equipment, the value of land, even value of livestock. But no doubt, the majority of conversation was about the classic car sale taking place in Carthage, Illinois on Monday and Tuesday of next week, selling outstanding vintage, collectible, and classic automobiles. The two-day online auction is Monday and Tuesday, February 19th and 20th. Other items selling next week, February the 21st, Cloverdale Farms LLC Retirement Sale in Maryland. Sean Hartung Retirement Sale, February the 21st in Havens, Kansas. Wright Implement, with their various locations in Indiana and Kentucky, will sell late model John Deere machinery on February the 20th, 2021 John Deere S 780 four-wheel drive combine, 2019 John Deere R 4044 sprayer, a 2022 John Deere 9R 590 four-wheel drive tractor, 2022 John Deere 8R 250 mechanical front tractor, late model planters, track tractors, hay equipment, all sell to the highest bidder next week. To buy or sell your equipment, Go to BigIron.com and SullivanAuctioneers.com. Our FFA Chapter Tribute is brought to you by Pioneer, developing new generations of seed innovations for new generations of farmers. Pioneer, what's next happens here. And we always love getting to meet that next generation of agricultural expert. And this week we are talking to Sophie Scheller down here on the grounds for the National Farm Machinery Show. Sophie, where's home for you? I live in Poseyville, Indiana about 30 minutes from Evansville, Indiana. And you're down here with the whole or a lot of the Poseyville FFA chapter, is that right? Yes, that's correct. How long did it take you guys to drive down to the, to the show? It took about two to two and a half hours to get here. All right, you'll get to have that going back as well. Sophie, what got you involved in FFA? Um, I love meeting new people and getting to do things with others that love what I love. And what of the ag industry, where are your passions lie? What do you like to do? I like um, livestock. I show in 4-H, so I've always loved the livestock industry. What livestock specifically are you raising to show? Pygmy goats. Pygmy goats. How long have you been in that business? Um, this will be my ninth year. Next year will be my tenth. Wow, a decade in the goat business. Sophie, as you look out in your life, in your career, do you hope to stay connected to agriculture? I do. I, In my future, I still want to stay connected, but I also want my kids and my family in the future to be connected in FFA and 4-H too. Being an FFA, do you think you're ever going to run for leadership? Um, okay, so in my 4-H, I am, um, I'm the vice president, so I do get to help lead that a little bit. That is outstanding. And do you love it, the, the ability to work with other students? I do love it. That is outstanding. Sophie, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us this week, and we wish you the best of luck in your FFA career and beyond. Thank you. Colby Ag Tech is brought to you by Copperhead Ag Products. Visit copperheadag.com for more information. Yes, we are swimming in technology down here, and our tech expert, Chad Colby, has another update for us. Thanks, Mike. You're definitely right. There's no shortage of new technology here at the National Farm Machinery Show. Behind me, as you can see, I'm in the new Holland booth. And like many booths here at the show, it's very busy because of the new technology. You can see their new combine behind me. They were given kind of the inside tours of that machine. I even ran into a new Holland dealer. He was pretty pumped up about it. He's actually gonna have some of these in the field this year. New Holland didn't just have a new combine, they also had a new round baler. 
And as a young man, I round bailed. So I know a little bit about that. And let me tell you, it's the Pro Series, they call it. And everything essentially is overbuilt for commercial use. They told me this is the first time that they've went down this path. It was pretty interesting to me. They also, of course, had the new undercarriage on their articulated four-wheel drive. But the more I walked around the show, I saw a lot of things that got my attention. And there was big crowds here this week. You know, there's always conversation in the spring about technology, about your planner. Certainly lots of road tillage conversations and even, of course, a lot of people in Precision Planning's booth checking out their new row unit that they debuted a couple weeks ago. And speaking of planners, the blue planner booth was busy at Kinsey at this year's show. They debuted a brand new planner, which was pretty interesting. They talked about their new cast row unit, which I really like the looks of that. And I'm a technology geek. So I had a nice conversation talking about their blue Vantage display. And they've got some pretty neat features of that coming here in the next year or two. Split screen, some other automation, the use of cameras, a lot of things in that space. Stay tuned, keep your eyes on the media, especially the, our friends at Farm Progress. There's gonna be a lot of articles and a lot of information coming out from this show here in the next few weeks, and I can't wait to share it with you. For This Week in Agribusiness, I'm Chad Colby. Thank you, as always, Chad, for that update. And folks, don't go anywhere. When we come back, we're gonna be learning a little bit more about this big red machine behind me. Stick around. Well, it's been the star here at the National Farm Machinery Show in Louisville. It's time to talk to the guy who really knows everything about this big AF11 combine, Leo Bose, Harvesting Marketing Lead at Case IH. Good to see you again. Oh, good to see you, Mac. Great to be here at you know, National Farm Machinery Show showcasing the AF11 series. I'm telling you, over the past week since it was introduced, it has been really interesting to watch not just your colleagues in the company, but your customers all over the world responding to what they're seeing. It's a big machine. Oh yeah, when you look at the capacity of this machine, it's packed with technology, but it's also runtime. That's really what our producers were looking for in that next size of machine. So the AF11 really delivers on that. You know, we, we don't usually think of harvesting this time of the year. Of course, it, you know, some folks will be in wheat fields later on, uh, on into the, the early days of summer. Uh, I talked to a friend the other day who got his combine in for servicing just the other day, so he was thinking about uh, the harvest season already. But when you look at a machine like this, you're reminded of the need for efficiency, the need for throughput. It, it will deliver when you really have that demand in the field. Oh yeah, and that's what our producers have really said. You know, we go through a customer-driven product definition process. So defining really what solutions we have, but really looking at their problems. So is to try to find that capacity and that throughput, but then how do we make it simple and intuitive in the cab? So when you look at over 46 years of axial flow design history and heritage, in fact, this combine delivers what we call from header to spreader. So it starts up in front, so we're showcasing a new C500 series corn head. So a C516, so 16 rows, 30 inch row spacing. And you look at the capacity brought into this machine, it starts there. That head is so crucial because you don't want ears bouncing out. You don't want them shattered in that process of trying to get them into the combine. It's an important part of the unit, isn't it? Oh, especially on the corn head. So we look at, and we can drive capacity with that corn head. So we want to pick faster, pick cleaner. And those are the attributes of that corn head. So when we get in the feeder house area, it's all about that thick crop mat. So we bring that crop mat up through the feeder house, but we have a new synchronized feed system. So we're actually speeding up and slowing down that relationship of that crop into the threshing and separating chamber. The back end of this combine, it's obvious you've made some changes there. And, and part of the key here is to get ready for the next planting season, is it not? Oh, exactly. When you get to the back of this combine, a whole new residue system. Actually, we have radar spread automation. So before, you used to have to maybe manually adjust that spread on the combine. Now we can automatically adjust based on radar. So whether it's sunny, dusty, the amount of residue, and we can spread up to now over 50 feet. It uh, was introduced to the dealers, I know, a few days ago. I'm sure there was quite a, quite a chatter among the crowd when they got to see it. But you've had a lot of farmer feedback along the way, have you not? 
Oh yes, multiple years. We look at the product development process. That's really core to what we want to get feedback for. And really implanting this machine into an operation. So what do we mean? It's not just a four to five hour run it. We actually bring it there for the whole entire season. So whether it's then in the morning, at night, so the whole servicing of that unit. So when we look at our pillars, that capacity, the technology, and the runtime, our customers really saw that in this design. When will farmers be able to start ordering? The oh, AFL that seems like the question, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> when can I get one? Right. When can I get one? So we'll actually have limited units out running this year, and then this summer we'll go through an order writing program with our dealers. So customers could go into the dealership at that point in time and then look at that combine you know, for the following year. The folks will be busy in Grand Island, won't they? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> our harvesting center of Exflix is in Grand Island, Nebraska, and that's where this machine will be produced. Great to see you, sir. Thanks for the visit. We appreciate it. Thank you, Max. Leo Bose, one of the guys we've seen over many of these years at the National Farm Machinery Show talking about that brand new AF11 combine from Case IH. It's been a privilege to be with you this weekend alongside Mr. Mike Pearson, who will be here next week again with This Week in Agribusiness. So long, everyone. This Week in Agribusiness has been brought to you by Case IH. Solutions for every challenge, equipment for every farm. Case IH, built by farmers. This Week in Agribusiness is produced by 22 Creative Group and has been a presentation of Farm Progress Broadcast. We invite you to visit us online at agbizweek.com.